In my last video, we learned what characteristics are used to define something as alive. So now that we know what life is, the next logical question is, where did it come from? Now before we start this video, I do have a confession to make. I, I feel I may have misled you by the title of this episode, because you see, I don't know exactly where life came from. But that's okay, because uh, no one does, and more than likely, nobody ever will. You see, in order to study ancient life, we rely almost entirely on the fossil record. And the fossil record is kind of like a book with 99% of the pages missing. It's estimated that only about 1% of all species that have ever lived on Earth have left behind fossil evidence. And the fossils of soft-bodied animals, such as ones without bones or at least an exoskeleton, are incredibly rare. And since the first living organisms were more than likely very, very small and very, very squishy, there's almost 0% chance that we're going to find fossils of those first original life forms. That being said, we've come closer than you might expect. The earliest fossil ever discovered was a stromatolite fossil, like this guy right here. Stromatolites are formed by mats of bacteria growing in between layers of sediment. And then when that sediment is compressed by the Earth's natural processes, it leaves behind this sedimentary stone with these cool little rings around it. Stromatolites can actually still be found living and growing in certain parts of the world like Shark Bay in Western Australia. So they are still around today, but the earliest stromatolite fossil ever discovered was dated at 3.5 billion years old. Which is even more impressive considering the fact that Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago. And the organism that formed that 3.5 billion year old stromatolite fossil was most likely something pretty close to modern day cyanobacteria, what we call blue-green algae or pond scum. But it's not an algae, it's a bacteria, so that's not confusing at all. While cyanobacteria is a fairly primitive creature, it's still a complex organism. Uh, a single cell can't just appear out of nowhere. Asking a living cell to appear on the early Earth is kind of like expecting a cake to just show up in your kitchen without buying eggs, sugar, and flour. You need the ingredients in order to make life. And the ingredients for life are organic compounds. Some common examples of organic compounds are amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, nucleic acids, essential for the formation of DNA and RNA, carbohydrates, sugars and starches to act as fuel, and lipids, your friendly neighborhood fats and hormones. So on an ancient, lifeless, molten planet, is it possible for these organic compounds to spontaneously appear? Believe it or not, I'm not the first person to ask this question. Actually, I'm not even the first person named Miller to ask this question. Meet Stanley Miller, seen here being the most intelligent Miller in this video, but only the second most handsome. Stanley Miller wanted to solve an interesting problem. How did biological matter arise from non-biological matter? Stanley wanted to see if he could create organic compounds by replicating the conditions of the early Earth. He did this in 1953 by combining hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor, and then exposing those gases to electric sparks. The electricity provided the gases with a source of energy similar to what would exist on the early Earth in the form of lightning strikes. And after only a week of running his experiments, Stanley Miller found exactly what he was looking for a large array of organic compounds, including amino acids. And as we said before, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, an essential step in the creation of life. Later experiments performed by Stanley Miller and replicated by other chemists under varying conditions came up with an even greater assortment of organic compounds. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. Not so fast. Stanley Miller's experiment proved that organic compounds could form on the conditions of the early Earth, but this is still a long way away from the appearance of an actual living cell. I'm gonna use another cake analogy because I'm lazy and hungry. If a living cell is a cake, then the organic compounds are the flour, sugar, and eggs. We have the ingredients, now they just need to be brought together. But we can't just mix the ingredients, slap it on a paper plate, and sing happy birthday. The ingredients need to be brought together in a way that's organized and functional. In order for this to happen, life needed a little helping hand from Earth's best friend, the Moon. Around 4.2 billion years ago, the Moon was much closer to Earth than it is today, and because of that, tidal forces were much stronger. This powerful ebb and flow of water resulted in consistent wet and dry cycles on the shores of prehistoric lakes, and the organic compounds that just formed became trapped in clay during those wet and dry cycles and began to polymerize, 
coming together to form protein-like basic materials and other more complex biomolecules. One of these new molecules was the early ancestor of RNA, which combined with other materials to form ribosomes that had the ability to replicate themselves. This was the important first step on the road to reproduction. Last, but certainly not least, a layer of lipids formed around these new complex molecules, keeping them all snuggled up together and forming what's called a protocell. Not quite a cell, but as close as you can get to being a cell without being an actual cell. Early protocells most likely got their energy from radioactive elements and underground geysers, but when Earth's magnetic field formed, the surface was protected from solar winds and cosmic rays, creating a new, safe environment where life could begin to thrive. Mutations within the stronger and more resilient protocells allowed them to convert energy from sunlight into electrochemical energy, and then use sugars to store that energy after the sun goes down. As time went on, proto-life continued to evolve, and eventually the sun-loving microbes replaced RNA with DNA, which gave them a much more reliable way to pass on genetic information and grow into more complex forms. These were the first prokaryotic organisms. But what is a prokaryotic organism? What is a eukaryotic organism? Where did plants and animals and fungi and bacteria come from? Why am I yelling all these questions at myself? Find out next week when we take a closer look at the many different paths that life began to take over evolutionary history, as well as how we use that evolutionary history to organize life into something that looks a bit like that. Consider yourself teased. Jesus Christ. So, where exactly did life come from? I don't know. And uh, it's more than likely that nobody will ever know for sure. You see, everything that I just told you is still technically unproven. It's just the most likely case scenario based on the current evidence that's been collected. And that's okay. One of the beautiful things about science is that it's a lot like detective work. When something happens that we can't see with our puny little human eyes, the best that we can do is look for clues and follow the trails until we come to something that's close to the full picture. The more evidence we find and the more experiments that are performed, the closer we get to forming that full picture. Remember that the only time we fail to learn is when we stop asking questions. So never stop asking questions and never stop evolving. I'll see you next week. I don't know what I expected would happen, but uh, I think it could have gone worse. <laughs>